I'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Hailama. This day would not be possible if it weren't for them because they gave me the kick in the butt necessary to get brewing again. They uh, purchased me a sneaky, they were sneaky though, but they purchased me a homebrew ingredient kit and had it shipped to my house. So it's like, hey, here, brew. So I'm brewing. Heat my sparge water. Today I have a special episode for you. I take you through a typical brew day. Today I'm brewing a beer called Orc's Blood. It's a milk stout, or some call it cream stout or sweet stout. Now let's get to brewing. Step one, heat the strike water. I brew all grains, so that means I have to start heating the water to mash the grain with. I need to mash at a specific temperature in order to activate the enzymes necessary to convert the starches in the malted barley into sugars. I use a program to calculate the exact temperature the strike water needs to be so that I hit my target mash temperature. I'm mashing this beer at 158 to release more compound sugars that are not as fermentable by the yeast. This will add to the mouthfeel and the residual sweetness of the beer, great for this style. When the strike water gets up to temperature, I add a measured amount to my mash tun to add the grist to. Step two, mash in. I add all the milled grain to the mash tun and stir thoroughly, breaking up any clumps, or dough balls as they're called, along the way. Malted barley used in brewing is roasted and toasted to different levels similar to the way coffee is. It smells like malt meal. Mm -hmm. This beer has four different kinds of malted barley. Each one adds different flavors to the overall taste. The bulk of the grain bill is made up of Maris Otter, a great British base grain. Break those dough balls. It also has Crystal 80, which adds caramel, a slightly burnt sugar flavor, and even raisin notes. Pale chocolate malt is next. It adds a roasted coffee flavor at high quantities, but it will add a great flavor to this beer as well. Oh, smooth Finally, the black patent. This will give the beer its black color, but will not make a significant flavor difference unless you use it high quantities.
I'll take a final temperature reading after all the grain is added to make sure it is at my target temperature. I'll add more hot or cold water if I need to adjust the temperature. This time, I nailed it right on the head. Oh baby, 158 on the money. Step three, sparge. Sparging washes the newly converted sugars out of the grain and into the boil kettle. Now it's called wort. Before I start putting the wort into the kettle, I need to vorloff. That means taking a bit of the wort out of the mash tun and putting it back through the mash. This will help set the grain bed so it can act like a filter to limit the amount of loose grains in the boil kettle. As you can see, it starts out lighter and full of grain, but darkens and has very little grain in it when I'm through. After that, I slowly drain the wort into the kettle while I run 170 degree water into the top of the mash tun. To prevent the sparge water from channeling through the grain bed, and not washing the grain equally, I use a pie plate that I drilled holes into to gently sprinkle the sparge water over the grain. I'll check the gravity of the wart during the process to ensure that I'm not over sparging the grain. This, along with the wrong pH, can pull undesired tannins from the grain. I have graduation marks on my mash paddle so I can see when I have gathered the right amount of wart. Step four, the boil. After I have gathered enough wort, I will start heating it to boiling temperature. Once it reaches a boil, I add the first hop addition. This beer only has one at the beginning for bittering. At the last few minutes of the boil, I add Irish Moss, a clarifying agent. A yeast nutrient that will aid in fermentation. And the lactose. hook up my homemade counterflow chiller to get ready to cool the wort from near boiling down to pitching temperature as it travels down to the fermenter. At flame out, I take a post boil gravity reading so I know if I hit my target. Step five, chilling. 
I hook up the chiller to the pot and turn on the water that will chill the wort. A copper coil runs inside the center of the chiller and cold water runs in the opposite direction on the outside. This will chill the wort very fast. The tubing and the inside of the carboy fermenter have been cleaned and sanitized thoroughly. Do something awesome. Anything? Tell me you love me. Who's my baby? Collect just over five gallons of wort. Step six, pitching the yeast. I made a yeast starter two days before my brew day with liquid yeast. This increased the cell count of the pitch, which will aid in a good fermentation and it ensured the viability of the yeast since it did travel through the mail. Up until this point, all we had was sugar water. Once the yeast is pitched, it becomes beer. I put on an airlock with sanitizer in it that will allow the CO2 to escape while the beer ferments, but won't allow any insects, wild yeast, or bacteria to enter the fermenter. Now we put it in a refrigerator with a temperature controller that will keep the beer in the correct temperature range for the type of yeast and the style of beer we're brewing. As you can see, the next morning, we already have a healthy fermentation. It's on its way to being good beer. Well, thank you for joining me. I hope you had a great time. I hope you learned something. If you got any questions about home brewing, uh, leave in the comments and I'll answer every one of them. Um, thank you again for Mr. and Mrs. Halama for sending me the ingredients to do this brew day. And maybe I'll send you a little surprise in the mail myself. Make sure and like and subscribe to the channel. And check out the Llamas channel. Mr. High Llama and Mrs. High Llama. Prost. I hate that I can't see a, uh, a light on that thing if it's rolling or not. Are we rolling? <laughs>
Um, so, <laughs> uh, 